Welcome to this episode of the Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast brought to you by Comfort Mechanical Contractors, Durham's premier commercial HVAC installation and service company. For more information, go to comfortmc.com or call 383-2502. I'm your host, Brian Kennedy. I did not get covered this week by the logo. Thank you, Scott, for that. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Josh Cox. Nope, still can't get it right. Oh, well. Josh Cox, Scott Medlin, and Jamie Holt. And we have had an adventurous week since our last episode with interim head coach Trooper Taylor. We've had hirings. We've had transfers in. We've had transfers out. We've had everything that you could think of leading up to a bowl game for a program. It has happened. But, fellas, let's get right into it. The biggest news possible, and that is Manny Diaz is officially the next Duke football head coach. There was a lot of rumblings. Manny was in the mix along with Jim Knowles and some others. We kept hearing things. News got retracted. Then more news came out. It was just a long week. But we're here. Manny Diaz, the 23rd Duke football head coach. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well as everything that's happened this week. We've got another mailbag edition. We've got this week in Blue Devil history. And, of course, we've got the tail of the tape. So fellas, let's let's dive in. Manny Diaz was named head coach uh, last week. Josh, you and I actually went to the presser uh, this past Saturday. We are back to recording on a Monday night at our, at our normal time. So whoever wants to get going first, let's get rolling. Thoughts for Manny Diaz being the next coach? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so number one, I mean, uh, Duke fans have trusted Nina King. They trusted Nina King two years ago. Um, and, and the coaching hire. And uh, once again, Duke fans are trusting Nina King again, and I think she's come through, followed through on her promise of getting Duke um, an elite, I believe, head coach. Uh, this time around, uh, you know, let, let's be real here. Duke's uh, current position being 9-4 and four and 7-5 and five in the last two years, a little bit better than what uh, we had when Coach Cutcliffe was leaving at 2-9 and nine and 3-9. And, nine. and so – Duke was able to land a head coach with head coaching experience this time around uh, in Manny Diaz. Obviously, the three years that he spent at Miami, if I can just say this is my opinion, and people can disagree with my opinion, um, so uh, you hear like a, a segment of fans that say he failed at Miami or that he did not do well at Miami. A couple of things there. He, he coached at Miami during COVID, the two COVID years. He happened to go eight and three, and seven and five in those two years. They went to a bowl game all three years that Manny was the head coach. They let him go after he won five out of six games in his final season as head coach. And so uh, let me just say this. I, 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 first of all, to think that Miami is supposed to like, what are they supposed to do? Win ACC championships or something? They haven't done that. And they've won one championship in the last, what, 35 years. So like, Let's be real, number one, about what the expectations should be at Miami. I think, I think Manny did great. And then he was able to step out of that role. As he said, uh, the body wasn't even cold yet, uh, wasn't even dead yet for Miami before he got hired at Penn State by James Franklin. And, you know, he got to learn uh, the way that I look at it. I mean, James Franklin is one of the most well-respected head coaches in the country. And he got to go to Penn State for two seasons and just, you know, kind of get back into it, right? The, the actual coaching on the field as, uh, instead of the head coaching spot. And like, um, and then he was ready again. And so I love the hire. I thought it was really good. I, I mean, obviously he's going to win as presser. He won the press conference. A couple of things that just from the behind the scenes about the press conference. Um, first of all, it was really cool to see a lot of fans uh, there. We got to hang out. We got to meet some new people uh, that listen to the pod. I've uh, gotten to see some old friends. Shout out to uh, Jordan Mann, who's basically uh, the fifth member of, of this uh, crew now. Uh, Jordan was there hanging with us. But I love the fact that Coach Diaz and his family, and Nina King, for that matter, stood around afterwards and literally, it wasn't just the press. It wasn't just, you know, people they knew. They talked to fans. Uh, they took pictures. Um, you know, Coach Diaz was very accessible to anybody. Um, so I, I really felt like that was really good. It was neat to see 25 to 30, uh, seemed like 25 to 30 players uh, that were present for the presser as well, showing their support. Uh, there were some interesting faces in the crowd. Uh, one would be Coach Cushing. 
That's all I can say. No idea why he was there, but I heard that he is a he is a Texas A and M fellow. But he was at the presser, um, and so uh, just some interesting things there. But yeah, I I, I love the hire. Looking forward to seeing uh, what Coach Diaz is going to do with this team. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, a lot of people have been asking for the last week or so, who did you think? Who did you think the final two would be? And, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the final two were Trooper and Coach Diaz. And, you know, it, it's a win either way as far as I'm concerned. I think Trooper Taylor is a great uh, rah-rah guy. He's somebody you want on your, on your side. And he proved that last week when we talked to him. He, he was all about Duke, and he's always been about Duke and whoever he's ever coached for. That's the type of person he is, and, you know, he, he he said the right things. And Coach Diaz came in, said the right things also. I hate it. we didn't get to make it over there because of some other things going on this past weekend. Had it been on Friday, I could have been there on Saturday. I already had plans and stuff, so I hate I missed out on it. But, you know, folks, I think we got our guy. I think we're going to be all right. This man is a great defensive coordinator, has been a great defensive coordinator in the league, in our league, whatever's left of it here, but in the ACC over the years, did a great job at Penn State, made Penn State alive for the last two seasons, and he's got some experience. Man's only 49 years old. Think about that for a minute. And no one, like what Josh just said a minute ago, all the great accolades and things that he did while he was at Miami and for Miami to let him go for the joker they have now that's just their fault but that just shows how stupid they are down there at the U anyway but great to have him on our side I'm looking forward now I, I, I will say this much and I, I may be stealing some of the mail bag and some of everything else so I'll just go ahead and throw this out here now I'm looking forward to some clarity and some definitions on what's going to happen in the next three weeks so we can know everything. We can know the roster, we can know the coaching staff, and we can know who's going to be part of the spring practice when we get there, which signing day is next to Wednesday, the 20th. So that's one more thing I'm looking forward to. And it's kind of like a prelim to the ball game to me. We get to see who's going to sign, who's not going to sign. And I, I know Coach Diaz is a great recruiter also. I've heard nothing but great things about him. And I know that's exactly what he's been doing probably since Saturday. He's been on the phone with everybody. He mentioned he was going to be on the phone with people. So that's another great thing. I think Nita did another great job. You know, it's funny. Um, it took her a little over. I think it took what, eight days, nine days. She doesn't play around when she sets up for this stuff. She's very re re well prepared. She has an idea. And that's why she is one of the best ADs in the country. There's, there's no way that you can do what she's done in the last couple of years and make the great hires and the level that she's done anywhere else. I think Duke is very lucky to have her on our side. I think as the news started to come out of uh, what coaches we were looking at and who we might be interested in, I think we all as a group and we were texting back and forth kind of got, you know, excited about the idea of, of Manny Diaz. And then when it actually happened, uh, we were thrilled. I mean, I was, I was thrilled. I think it's a great hire. He's been successful everywhere he's gone. I mean, I won't, I won't talk about it too much because you guys have pretty much said everything I, I wanted to say. But I'm really excited about him getting started and seeing where we can take him. And like Scott said, I'm interested to see what happens with the coaching staff and what happens with with the portal guys, which we'll get get into that in the questions. But all in all, I'm just, I think it's a great hire really impressed with Nina. I, I really am impressed with Nina for two coaching searches now, not just the one, but uh, she made the right hire the, the first time too. Unfortunately, we lost Elko uh, or he sh who should not be named or whatever, Ooh. whatever, her, whatever her name is. <laughs> like uh, we, uh, we lost her. We lost her a little bit early, but you know, a little premature, a little premature, uh, but you know, got Manny. I think, I think we're going to be good. Uh, he's been, like I said, he's been successful everywhere. Miami fans are, are a funny bunch, uh, 21 and 15 overall. And I think, what was it? 16 and nine in the ACC. Uh, so that's pretty good to me, but at Miami, they're, they're kind of, kind of like, I know we don't like to mention basketball, but kind of like Duke basketball fans where, where you're kind of funny about that kind of stuff. But, uh, anyways, 
great hire, and I really look forward to Coach Diaz getting started. Well, and as I mentioned when we came on, there's been a lot going on. Jaquez Moore went into the portal. Now he's out of the portal. Yep. Uh, a lot of reports were coming out. Trooper Taylor was on his way down to College Station to be the running backs coach. Nina King came out today. We are recording again on a Monday night. Josh is – Hold Josh on, Brian. Is, Listen, one hour before Nina King came out and said what she said about Trooper Taylor, your boys at the Duke Football Talk po- uh, Section 17 podcast confirmed that Trooper Taylor would be the coach. But it was officially oh. official by a Duke official on the official day that they came out with the official you know, announcement. <laughs> let's put it this way. I I had as official as you're going to get there you from go. the Duke program on that. But, no, you're right, Brian. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I was I was just messing around. We did get the tweet out before. Yeah, that, so. yeah true. You, Nina, but, you got to step your game up. But but speaking of Nina, we, we talked with her after the presser. Two things. One, folks, if you don't think she's on Twitter, Look at how she announced that Duke had found their head coach. Peter J- Dodge, our biggest mass hole, kept doing the whole, hey, when the Pope gets announced, the smoke comes out of the chimney. Nina, when are we going to see it? Well, what did Nina do when they finalized the details? She did the chimney with blue smoke. I gave her kudos to that. Secondly, she told us verbatim that she listened to our reaction episode after Mike left in the middle of the night. I was, I'm was, i going to be honest. I was surprised, Josh. I don't know if you were surprised by it, but... Folks, these people care about this program. Nina King cares. Art Chase cares. Manny Diaz, he already cares. And he's only been in Durham now for, what, four days, five days? Um, And he's hit the ground running. I mean, he's on the recruiting trail as we speak, trying to not only retain the recruits that are verbally committed, hopefully to get the ink on the paper next week, but he's out trying to Get prospects some transfer portal because guys, we're gonna ha- we're gonna need some guys to come in from the transfer portal. Um, shout out again. I'm gonna kind of echo what Josh said. Ch- shout out to the fans. When it was first announced that it was open to the fans, didn't really know how many people would show up. But I tell you what, I'd say it was about 80, 85 percent full capacity for where they had the press conference, and there wasn't a fan that we talked to who didn't like what Manny had to say. So, in essence. This could have gone one of two ways for this program. We could have gotten our guy, or we got our guy, like we're doing right now. We're anticipating the bowl game. We're getting ready for signing day. Or it could have gone the opposite direction. Some programs have that happen when a coach leaves, a coach who is uh, winning games. And, and again, Mike Elko won games for this program. You can be mad at him for how he left, but still, the fact is this. He won what was it? Nine games last eight games. I've already forgotten. I mean, but thank you. Nine games. And then he won seven games this year. Thank you. We're see it's again, it's, it's almost my bedtime still catching up from last week's recording with trooper. But if I'm being serious, everything that has needed to happen so far has happened. The foundation's still there. And now Manny's got to build off of it. And with trooper officially being the coach, you're not going to have it to where he leaves before the bowl game and then there's calamity because things that's happened before a coach leaves, he goes to his new destination, he gets other coaches and then a team's left in disarray and they get blown out in the bowl game. So that's not going to happen. So that leads me to believe. And again, I I don't have inside knowledge on this, Josh, maybe you've talked to folks. I think Manny Diaz is going to wait till after this bowl game is complete, see how things go and then make his assessment as far as staffing needs who stays, and who go, goes. It's ultimately a business. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say this. I know for a fact that the current coaching staff is being relied upon, obviously with Coach Diaz, um, the current coaching staff is being relied upon to secure the current recruits to signing day on Wednesday. And obviously what happens from there, I'm sure, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. I mean, I'm sure if Kevin Johns is going to be retained, which we do not know that, but if he is going to be retained, I mean, I'm sure there's verbal, some verbal agreements and talks, but I would assume that, uh, you know, those things wouldn't be made official until, like you said, Brian, after the bowl game, especially because Duke is playing an earlier bowl game, um, you know, before Christmas. And so, like, I feel like you do have a little bit of, of time there. Obviously, yeah, we mentioned Kevin Johns. I mean, he's super important, not only for retention, right, uh, of current players inside the locker room, 
but also because of, you know, look, let's face it, elephant in the room here. The number six overall quarterback um, in the country is Tyler Cherry. And we're, we are strongly assuming that Kevin Johns is a big reason why Cherry, you know, committed in the first place. And so, you know, if, if a guy like Kevin Johns is coming, I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure he has a verbal and he's able to communicate that to the players. But let me just say this before we get in the mailbag. We're heading to the mailbag, Jamie. Get ready. We're ready to roll. I do want to say this, Brian. You hit on it, um, and I know maybe some questions will, 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 will dance around this, but fans, I want, I want to try to give us some perspective here. I've seen more than one, and I've even seen a couple of players, you know, hint um, at David Cutcliffe um, during ball. all of this. Yes. Um, and I understand. L- let me just say, I understand that when David Cutcliffe, I understand what he did for Duke's program, taking us from like the depths of the depths of the depths, bringing us into the 21st century, really um, helping Duke become a relevant brand in football. And I understand that as a part of that, there was an offer that came in from Tennessee that coach Cutcliffe turned down and stayed in Durham. I get it. I get that. I also would like to remind Duke fans that, of three and nine and two and nine. And I would also like to remind Duke fans of the last season where it wasn't that Duke was getting beat. It's that Duke was getting trounced and they were rolling over and they were playing dead and the fan base, we were literally screaming at speaking of Nina King's Twitter. We were screaming at Nina King's Twitter to fire this man in the middle of the season. I want everybody to understand that. The season ended. David Cutcliffe did not retire. It's been three years now. I'll just say this. He did not retire. Read the words that were printed. They decided to part ways. Let me help you with that. He was asked to not return. Okay, so that. Secondly, before we completely poo-poo all over Mike Elko, and, and we've joked about it, there was not one Duke fan Prior to that Sunday and into that Monday morning, there was not one Duke fan that was not all in on the Elko era. Everybody was Elko this, Elko that, Elko this, Elko that. We all hate the way he left. Every single one of us do. We happen to know and and, and have relationships with folks, the four of us, to understand that like there was probably some of that stuff. There was no way he was going to be able to change it. It was going to have to happen that way. And and there's no way he wanted to go out that way. But like I think we need to stop like romanticizing the past because ultimately we got rid of the past because we were two and nine and three and nine and we couldn't compete in the ACC. One ACC victory in two seasons, if I'm not mistaken. So like that's my soapbox. Let's move on to Manny Diaz. Brian, you got it. Let's well, move no, on no, to Manny no. Diaz. But daggone, let's stop like romanticizing. Your well, ex-girlfriend is uglier now than what she was when you were dating her. Well, and I said this, and I'm, I'm going to polish this one up a little bit. It's kind of the analysis that I gave the guys before we started recording. It's like your grandfather that's passed away. You miss your grandfather. You want your grandfather back. But then as you start thinking about your grandfather, you remember the skeletons that he had in his closet that didn't make grandfather as um, – squeaky clean as most people thought him to be. And again, to Josh's point, don't get me wrong. David Cutcliffe got us out of the dark ages, got us to a spot that no one thought a Duke team would ever get back to five winning seasons though, in 12 years, I'm going to be on, I'm, I'm with Josh folks. We can, we can remember the good times, but there were skeletons in the closet, Josh. And- and look, it oh, was, <laughs> look, it wasn't exactly a good breakup either. Like, it's not like, it's not like he's going to be coming back to Duke to, to, I don't know what people want, like him to coach the bowl game or whatever. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not happening. Hey, it's not he, happening. And he it was wasn't there, breakup. folks. He was not there when they honored that 13 team. Don't forget that. What what game was that? I can't even remember. Uh, it uh, was, uh, maybe the Wake Forest game? Was it the Wake what, Forest was it night the game? Wake or State. I thought, and I, I, well, they played NC like State. no, it was NC State because we yeah. said they brought Devon Edwards back because they were playing NC State. Yes, the the ghost of Devon Edwards. So yeah, so, you're exactly right, Brian. And let me just, if I may word it this way, he was not invited to that game. I, that's all I'll say, and I pray to God the wrong people aren't listening to this podcast. <laughs> he was not invited to the game. Well, to quote Scott, if you had us talking about David Cutcliffe for more than five minutes after David Cutcliffe's been gone for three years, you get to mark your bingo card. 
Yeah, and, and, and by the way, I'll wrap it up. But like, I'm just like, it, it, it is like toxic fan that's like romanticizing the past because we're going through like a, a difficult thing with the current or the, you know, the coach. Like at the end of the day, let's just move forward. Like I'm all about it. Listen, Duke football has been up and down, up and down, up and down. Duke football climbed the last two seasons very rapidly. And, and I think all Duke fans can agree with this. Let's get on board with what Manny Diaz is going to do. And let's see if we can't continue that uphill climb and get to where we are uh, in the ACC championship game. Let's get to where we are in contention for that uh, top 12 uh, going into next season. So, all right, I'm off my soapbox. Jamie. And I would like to say if the wrong people are listening, it was not my idea, not my <laughs> fault. I had nothing to do with it. Josh blames it was COVID. It was, it was yeah, it was me. It was me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, Jamie, let's let's hit the mailbag, man. Let's see what people got to say. All right, we're gonna come out swinging off of Twitter at the Duke of Cupa. What will we consider the barometer for a successful first season with Coach Diaz? Six and six, seven and five, or just not leaving in the middle of the night? Like midnight Mike, one night caller. <laughs> Leaving on the midnight plane to Texas. But, uh, <laughs> but for me, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you get to a bowl game in your first year, especially after everything that we're losing this year, all the play, all the players we lost, Dwayne Carter, Riley Leonard, numerous, numerous players off these last few teams that uh, have been both both back to back bowl games. If, I mean, if he gets to a bowl game, then I'm very proud. Very say that's a very successful season. So really quick, and I posted this right when Manny was hired. Duke's schedule is pretty much set in stone. We got confirmation on the fourth non-con team. So you're going to have Northwestern, UConn, Middle Tennessee State, and Elon as your four non-con games. Four very winnable games to start the season out 4-0, potentially not trying to jinx anything. Then the Manny Diaz, uh, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm drawing a blank. Not the reunion tour, revenge, revenge tour. The revenge yes. Tour. We've got Florida State. You know, Florida State and Miami, they had a hated rivalry. Florida State's a home game. Yep. You've got a certain team eight miles down the road who, if you remember the video between Mac and Manny, wasn't exactly a cordial handshake. SMU. Well, knew- well wait, wait, wait. I'll tell you why. Because Mac fired Manny at Texas like mid season, right? I think it was yep. mid season. See, so, there, there's so many storylines that these networks are going to have fun with with these games. You've also got Virginia Tech, you've got at Georgia Tech, then you've got a little game in South Florida at Miami. That's going to be a fun one. Whether we're going to be there or not, don't know yet, depending on how the schedule comes out. January 30th, 2024, just throwing that out there. At NC State, at Wake. Six wins is very doable. I'm already saying it. Six wins, very doable. And I see a few ACC wins in there as well with the reshuffling of the of the chairs with transfer portals and everything like that. So I would think at least a bowl game would be somewhat the expectation because, again, it's not like the foundation of this program was completely gutted and torn down. So six I wins. Agree. I think, Brian, I think if, if we had not done the new conference realignment, had we had the schedule that we were going to have, I would have said yep. eight wins. Right. Because I felt like that was, that was an easier schedule. No Florida State. No, You know what I mean? Like that, right. that type of deal. But the new schedule, I think making a bowl game, I agree. I would agree with you guys. And and Duke administration, I promise, because I was kind of chewed out on Saturday afterwards, I will not go to FBSschedules.com anymore. I will reach out directly to you guys when I have any scheduling (laughs) questions. Thank you for that reminder. All right. Christopher B. McLaughlin off of Facebook. He says he's fired up for Diaz Dominance. Uh, It it now seems certain that Feely stays, right? I mean, that's been pretty much – a done deal, correct? So, yeah, I don't think you take a photo with Manny Diaz holding up his yeah. jersey if you're going to be going. So, yeah, I'm pretty. We're pretty certain based off of what we saw in the conversation. Like, I've never seen David Feely that happy, Josh. I don't. I don't know if you've ever seen him, but when we he actually spoke with us, he was in a great mood. Complimented yeah. my hair. I mean, come on. <laughs> but uh, no, he he was in a great mood. Sat with the team, but afterwards, I mean, he was he was very happy. Yeah. This is what do you think about the DC and OC positions? Yep. I mean, and I'd be, 
honestly, I'm fine if if he retains Kevin Johns and Tahar Santucci. I'm I'm cool with that. If he wants to, I mean, I'd hate it for Johns and Santucci, but if he wants to hire his own, if Diaz wants to hire his own staff, I get that as well. So it's just yeah. kind of. No, I would say this, Jamie. Um, so he's a defensive guy, and this is y'all know. I mean, we're big Tyler Santucci fans. We love Tyler. Um, I would say that Kevin Johns has a probably greater chance of being retained with Diaz being a defensive guy. He's probably looking for an offensive guy. Honestly, one of the knocks on Coach Diaz at Miami uh, was that was that he did not hire uh, solid coordinators. And so I think if you know you have a respected OC who's honestly waiting for a good head coach head coaching gig to open probably, uh, and Kevin Johns, I think you try to do everything you can to keep him. My question about Santucci is simply this. I, I don't question his loyalty to Duke. I don't question his loyalty to those guys. From what we hear, he is like the favorite in the locker room. But I wonder if like the scheme. So the one thing you could say about Santucci was he was an Elko guy. So Elko and Santucci got each other. He understood what Elko wanted, and he could go implement it. Diaz is a defensive guy. There's no way Diaz and Elko are equal and have the exact same philosophies. So there will be a learning curve there. And so that's why I'm not sure on the Santucci thing, but it could work. It could happen. There's no question. Scott, are you still with us, man? Or are you? What's the score of the game, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> uh, seven, nothing and zero, zero. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm Scott's still zoning out over there. <laughs> no, you guys are saying all the things that I'm thinking. So I'm just trying to wait till my turn comes. Well, Scott, your turn is the ne- you're answering the next question. It's coming I need to you. A, I need a soapbox question, though, so find me a soapbox question. Pre- Preacher Medlin's waiting, Jamie. So, like, we got a, a th- uh, I guess, a third part to this question, too. He says, any chance we retain any of the players we've seen in the portal? And as Brian mentioned, we already this saw. Is, this, we'll this we'll go to perfect, Scott on this one. This is a perfect time for some soapbox. So, not to uh, uh, go at Chris or anything, but things to remember, folks. Number one, if anybody transfers, that's their right. They can do whatever they want to do. Be happy for them. Congratulate them. Wish them nothing but luck. If a recruit who has not yet signed on the dotted line decides in the next eight days to change their mind, same difference. Don't go at them. Don't attack them. Don't say anything to them. Which, one, you shouldn't be talking to recruits anyway. But number two, don't go at these kids. Okay, folks, let them do their thing. You know, they are trying to look out what's better for them. They may not think they can thrive under Coach Diaz. If they can't, so be it. Maybe they think they need to go somewhere else. Let's be honest. Maybe the bag of money somewhere else is a little bit more than the bag of money they're going to get here. I mean, let's be honest. I'm 47. If you offer me a bag of money right now, I may not have a hard time not taking that bag of money and run it especially right now since I'm unemployed. But anyway, um, other than that. But what, hey, would, what wouldn't you do for a bag right now, Scott? I wouldn't wouldn't do a – I wouldn't need a Klondike bar live. Okay. <laughs> that wouldn't be fun. But back to the original question that was asked, I apologize. Um, you know, that part's going to be interesting to see who stays and who goes. Right now, I mean, no, we've, there's only been a name or two has officially, officially, officially went into the portal. And from what we've heard, there's some people that on the uh, that was on the defensive side of the ball from Penn State, there's like six or seven of them. So even if we could land one or two of those guys to come back to come co- play under Coach Diaz, that would be awesome. I just, you know, it, again, that's my whole thing from 15 minutes ago. I don't know where we're going to be at in, in two weeks. Once we get all this stuff in, you know, by hopefully by the first of the year, then everything will be settled down because there's going to be a million questions even after things settle. There's going to be people that don't get retained that we think should be retained. There's going to be people that are going to go that we think we sh- should stay. I mean, we said, we jokingly said a while back, we thought Riley should stay here at Duke. But we can't tell you what Riley's going to do. It's none of our business, to be quite honest with you. We're just fans. He's got to do what's right for him. And the same thing with the other uh, 85 kids that are on the football team. I will say this. The biggest win in Coach Diaz's uh, 
Duke career so far is getting getting Jacquez back. I mean, that's <laughs> that was pretty big time. Like you got a guy that's uh, run for a little over what a little over six hundred yards and six touchdowns, and just uh, sharing sharing carries. That's uh, that's pretty big time. So that that really helps that RB room. Uh, next question is from at Ross Jacob six eight four. Uh, another portal question. Do we hit the portal for a quarterback or do we roll with the uh, combination of Loftus, Beelan, and hopefully Tyler Cherry? And I would I would write off, I mean, if Tyler Cherry does end mm-hmm. up coming in like his commitment, I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with that QB room. I don't know about – what do you think, Brian? Yeah, I agree. I, if Tyler Cherry does decommit and go elsewhere, we hit the portal. But we're going to need to hit the portal sooner than later. Because it feels like quarterbacks are just going off the board, or they're at least acknowledging where they're going to be going when it's time to sign on the dotted line. There's a probably a point zero 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 one percent chance that Riley comes back. I'm still holding that door a little open. I know Josh is shaking his head, but I'm just saying you never know. Um, so yeah, I think if Tyler does come in, that's going to be a fun spring to see the QB competition to see who would be the starter come August. Yeah, let me let me say this. Number one, I do think that a quarterback room of Henry Beelan and Grayson Loftus can can get Duke uh to bowl games and winning football. So like please don't take anything we're saying. I Henry Beelan showed number one, not only did he show his skill and talent this year, but he showed his team first attitude in that state game. Had no business being out there. Um with his shoulder the way it was and really probably messed the rest of the season up for him to win that game for Duke. And so like that, um, I got, let me, let me get to my point real quick, Brian. And then obviously what we've seen in Grayson for what the last four games, four games, I think the last four games of the season, uh, and just the progression that you saw from that wake forest game until the end, I mean, <laughs> that UNC game, that fourth quarter and overtime of UNC, I mean, that dude was as good as any quarterback that we've seen. And so all that to be said, I've got three letters for you. If Tyler Cherry decommits, I have three letters for you. Manny Diaz, T-V-D. T-V-D. Tyler Van Dyke. Scott, stop shaking your head. Tyler Van Dyke under Manny Diaz was an all-ACC quarterback. Tyler Van Dyke under, under Manny Diaz was all-ACC. Oh, Scott, he's typing. He's typing. Come on, man. Come, oh, oh man! But we can't be doing. We can't be recording while these two Monday night football games are going on. Scott, we know what Scott's <laughs> worried about. No, and, and folks, again, I'm not throwing shade at either Henry or Grayson, but I'm just saying you've got to have that third quarterback because of what we experienced as a football team this year. No one, including Grayson Loftus, expected him to play four games, start four games. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely need that third QB. Uh, question from Pradeep off of Facebook. Uh, a lot of offensive line was injured this season and or, you know, graduating, obviously. Um, should we also target OL? Obviously, another portal question. I, that's a that's a big yes for me. Uh, you're losing Graham Barton, Jacob Monk, among others. Uh, Scott Elliott. Need, Scott Elliott. Well, McIntyre, need, potentially. You know, Jacob Monk, if you didn't already say yeah. that. Yeah. I think you I said did. Jacob Monk. Scott yeah. Elliott. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, oh, Monday, oh, Monday night meddling up there. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to start giving us uh, score updates here without asking. <laughs> yeah, you, we've got to. This is probably going to be the one uh, room that's going to be hurt the most with graduations, transfers, everything. Uh, Duke did offer to the big 6'9 kid out of Yale. He was like 6'9, 340 or something. I mean, he dude was a hoss. He would have been great to join. He's already committed. So Duke's got to keep hitting that portal because there's no one to protect the quarterback. There's not going to be much happening as far as offense goes. Yeah, and I would say, like, you spend the money there. Uh, if you've got to spend money in the portal, spend it on the line. And, uh, you know, I think Duke, I think we saw this season, right, that, like, you know, if we're honest, some of the struggle this year was because we weren't really controlling the line of scrimmage on the offensive side of the football. So I think, you, I think if you're going to spend some money in the portal, spend it there. I think we need three guys, at least, because we've still got some freshmen who sat out the year that didn't play a down. Those guys, plus the guys that are coming in, it would be nice to have some older guys there to help the young pups up. 
Yeah, and you got Pickett and Parker. Uh, sounds like a law firm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and some guys like Craycraft and some guys like that that have gotten some some minutes and some snaps. But uh, but yeah, you're right. I believe I believe you, you for sure could uh, use some some fifth year grad transfer type guys in there that are just older. Need a settlement claim? Call Pickett and Parker. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right. I thought this was, next question was good. Uh, at LA Dodgers all day, Sam coming in with a weekly question. Hypothetically, if each of us could pick one current player in the portal that's not from Duke to be on next year's team, who are you choosing? And he said if it's too difficult, he said you could go like position. But since I'm uh, unmuted, I, I had a guy. Because I, I remembered him, I remembered seeing him going into the portal like just a few days ago, and um, he's a wide receiver from from Miami, uh, Colby Young, who was six foot five and two hundred fifteen pounds, and he caught forty seven passes for five hundred sixty three yards and five touchdowns. He was third on their team in receiving. I just went with him because we've always we talked about all year how we needed some needed some more height in the uh, in the receiver room. So I thought I thought that that might be a a good one to go for if I if I had a choice. I mean, if, gosh, we're talking a thousand plus players in the portal. I mean, it might take me a while to look, but going back to what we were just talking about, anyone that's an offensive lineman and has some skill, sign me up. You know, we we need all the help we can get, plain and simple. Josh, Scott, you guys have anyone? I know. I think y'all are probably looking. I mean, I'm not even going to try to think of a name. I mean, the guys, I just saw this a, a Georgia four star. Uh, player offensive lineman just enter the portal folks this is going to be happening for the next however long it's going to be players are going to continue to enter the portal get out of the portal sign with the team decommit from a team so there's just a lot of, of moving parts when it comes to the yeah the one the one guy was like the number of uh, number one overall what was it? uh walter or something nolan or so, something nolan or he, I think he, <coughs> he was a DB, but I, I actually found someone as, as I was looking. You know, UCLA has stolen from Duke over the last few few seasons. You know, uh, obviously our guy Bobo, but Britton Brown, Gary, uh, what was that guy's name? The big guy, uh, the interior uh, defensive lineman. But anyway, um, stole him. Uh, John Humphrey uh, is a four-star, former four-star recruit um, who is a defensive back. And I think, obviously, with the loss of Al Blades, um, with the loss of uh, half uh, half of Miles Jones that we had this season, um, it'd be nice to get you know one guy there or and or in that safety spot, you know where J. Lou was. Uh, Stinson, if Stinson you know winds up you know staying in the transfer portal and heading somewhere else, you know. So I think the secondary needs the boost as well. Scott, you got anybody off the top of your head? I'm looking at a thousand names here in the <laughs> transfer portal. Just, I mean, and there's really some good guys, some good names, but positions I don't think we need. I mean, somebody, Mikey Harrison from Colorado was a, was a tight end. He had a really good season for them. Uh, guy that Bruce Minnick would hate to see, ETN, if we were to lose another running back, have him come in. Yep. I mean, th those are – top names I can think of. There's a thousand quarterbacks. DJ Ukulele, we wouldn't need him. We don't need him. And if we could get the kid from Ohio State, there you go. There's a win. But Look, we, man, we, are, we don't need a quarterback. So that's yeah, what you I'm got, saying. Yeah, that NIL mess. I mean, that, for those positions. I was messing about those. No, State I'm just saying in general, it. though. And running back like ETN or one of those guys. I mean, at the end of the day, their price tag is just so high. And so uh, it's just weird, isn't it? It's different to think that like a Marvin Harrison Jr., is legitimately considering his future because of the amount of money he can make in NIL if he stayed another season. It's crazy. It's just a different world. But, yeah, uh, that, that's a great question, though, uh, Sam, by the way. Hey, really one, actually made us think. Hey, one other one, uh, Brendan Rice, Jerry Rice's son, that transferred from Colorado to USC, is back in the portal. Now, that kid had a great season at Colorado his freshman year. Gracie's not there. And, hey, just for what it's worth for Sam, just because you signed Otani, you're still not going to win a World Series ring. We've done NFL, and now we've done MLB. Hell, might as well throw NBA in there somewhere. LeBron James is the GOAT. Well, there also, we go. well, you know what happened this we'll week? We'll trigger somebody there. You know what happened this week? 
Bronny James broke LeBron's record for uh, points scored in a college basketball game with two. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was yeah, pretty that good. was good. Yeah, I'll give you that uh, one, Josh. That caught me off guard. I was like, where are you going with this? Uh, okay. <laughs> back back to regular regularly scheduled programming. Uh, Regina Lee on Facebook, she wants to know if I will be at the beach or in Birmingham, which – Actually, I'm not going to be in Birmingham. We've got we've got plans, unfortunately, but uh, um, I will be watching since luckily the game is at 12 p.m. and our plans aren't till aren't till that evening. So fortunately, uh, I will be watching at high noon, but not at the bowl. Hope, hopefully, next year we'll go to a bowl and I'll be able to get back. Um, she also moves on and says, "Do you think?" I thought this was a good question because honestly, I have no idea. Manny might want to start completely over. Do you think Elko's grind signage comes down? Or is that something that uh, Diaz leaves alone? Or, or does, he, does he start over with something something new, a new slogan? If they had not just renovated everything, I would say 100%. But let's be honest, folks. Bleed Blue and Grind have been part of a winning culture. And I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yes, the man that came up with it is no longer here. But if you tear down all that, you're tearing down those last two years to the players. That's, I mean, it's really for the players if if we're looking at this. And there's still players that played for Mike these last two years that are still going to be here. I think, me personally, and again, no inside knowledge, I think you leave that alone. You wait a couple years. If things keep progressing, keep, keep winning, why change a good thing? But... If things aren't going the way that they should, coaches are superstitious. I don't know if that would be something to where, okay, you know what? Bleed blue and grind. We're done with it. We're going to do something else because, you know, going back to grandpa and Duke gang, that got immediately removed once Elko got in because the last two years were a losing culture. So I don't know. It's going, going to be interesting to see. I don't think you take bleed blue away because that is just, something that fans can say as well. Lifelong fans like the four of us, we've bled blue since as far back as we could remember. Grind, though, I don't know. It might just be a personal preference for Manny. Well, yeah, I mean, we got rid of the Duke gang thing. And by the way, Duke fans, I mean, that went out the door with David Cutcliffe. I know some of y'all still use it, but uh, we got rid of the whole Duke gang lingo uh, with Elko. But once again, I, I get what you're saying, Brian. That was because that was kind of a part of a losing culture at the time. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see that, but I will say, just keep your eyes open and be perceptive on the Duke social media, the official social media account, what they begin saying and how they begin saying things. If coach Diaz is going to do something different, you'll start seeing it there. And then you'll slowly see things, you know, transform around the locker room and stuff. But I actually agree with you, Brian. I think that's a good point that, you know, it's not that it's not that anything needs to be, torn down it needs to be built upon so who knows it could definitely stick around i'll I'll take it one step further before you get to the next question will the script come back on the helmets i'm i i know josh i know but like this one right here behind me and we all know that he who shall not be named even though i've named him three or four times hated the script did not want the script to be anywhere near the yo center or on the uniforms or on the helmets just curious, or maybe Manny's got something up his sleeve. He might have something new as far as uh, jerseys go. But I know that's the last thing on his mind right now. I will say this, too, of uh, that Duke gang. That Duke gang thing was kind of stupid. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Yeah, uh, nothing, bleep, bleep is, nothing is more opposite of Duke <laughs> than a gang. Yeah. Right? Like, just like gang. the nerd school, man. Come on. Yes. Hey, he would like... He would like tweet, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he like tweet like bang Duke gang or something? Bang bang. Like, no, 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 no. Bang Hold on. bang. bang. <laughs> you can get Twitter. <laughs> Hold up now. All right, Tyler. There's there your there's your weekly edit. <laughs> we could go bang bang Duke gang. Bang Duke gang. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, oh, we and this, mark this, we just I marked this explicit now, man. Good Jeez. lord, TV, we just got TVMA. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> not so, not so bad that I'm watching the football games now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, composure, composure. You got this. All right, let's move on. All right, 
<clears throat> at Skilo22. I got Freddie over at Duke Report. Uh, he had asked about the schedule, but we kind of already got into that. Brian got into that a little earlier, but he, he also wants to know if Brian has a has a pre <laughs> a pre preseason bowl projection ready yet for next season. So it's like the uh, never too early top 25 after the final four happens or the never too early. Brian is the the Joe Lenardi of bowls where we haven't even started the first bowl game and we're already trying to figure out what his bowl (laughs) games are for 24 and 25. Hey Scott, if I get paid like Joe Lenardi, I'll do, I'll do them in the summertime. I don't care. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just one thing that we've learned even in the last two years is that a team we think could be dominant preseason could suck. And then the team that we think, eh, this team's not going to do good, they come out of nowhere. I mean, Louisville this year was a prime example. Even though Mark Packer, friend of the pod, he picked them to be the sleeper team. Boy, was that a good pick. Whereas two years ago, once um, Elliott was named the coach of Virginia, a lot of people were saying Virginia was going to be good. Hasn't been what people in Charlottesville have wanted. So, Freddie, to answer your question, Nope, not even going to try because I'll jinx the team. I'm I'm superstitious in that. All I know is that, buddy, come week one of 2024, me and you will have our bowl project predictions going back to it. And Josh is so excited by that. I mean, he is so happy. <laughs> Fred, so, you know I love you, man. But, like, I'll, I will check that out on your website at about week 12. I'll so I, heard, uh, I heard Brian say playoffs there. That's what – that's what – that's what I gathered from. All hey, playoffs. so it'll be so so it'll be the seven seed Liberty Flames against the uh, another thing. Me and Josh go back and forth the, the, about the ten seed Duke Blue Devils. There you go. Had, hashtag the Lord's team. All right. Uh, I th- no, I thought this was a funny question. I mean, you, not everybody might not get this humor. I don't know, but it was funny to me at Duke Defender. Why do some people look over the fact that we just hired a head coach? that went undefeated at Temple. He's bound to be the Duke GOAT. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. Now, Manny, you know what- if you look into, like, because I, I was Googling all this stuff, too. Like, <laughs> Damn it, Josh. <laughs> the private chat got us again. Got all of us this time. <laughs> hey, that question is kind of like the whole Ronnie James thing a minute ago. You want to be technical? Well, hey, when was that? That was right before he went to Miami, right? Yeah, yeah. he he got Temple? hired at Temple, yeah. and then he turned right he around turned, and uh, went to Miami. The Miami job came open like three days later. Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, and I, I know he uh he actually felt really bad about it because I, I was googling it and watching like you know some interviews from from back in the back in the day when that happened. He felt, I mean, he felt really bad about it. And I'm I'm sure he honestly would still feel bad about it if you asked him about it, but. I just thought that was a hilarious question. So he is undefeated at Temple. It's true. Never lost a game. All right, what's next, Jamie? You're muted. Dang it. Wow. This is uh this is going really well. Uh at Blade for Duke. Uh, looking back at his Miami tenure, what areas will Coach Diaz need to show the most growth as a head coach to keep Duke moving in the right direction? Okay, I asked him this question. Um, well, I, the, not this question, but I asked the question at his presser of basically what did he learn from his time at Miami and then with James Franklin for his two seasons, um, and that is on the CEO side. So, like, one of the criticisms at Miami was his coordinators, and I honestly don't even know who his coordinators were at Miami. I'm sure other y'all uh, y'all can fact check me. I'm sorry, I should know maybe, but I don't know who they were. But I've heard that, and so. You know, I would say that 100% would be um, where I would focus if I were him, starting from your your biggest hires or your DC and your and your uh, OC because your strength and conditioning guy is already locked in. And you got one of the, you got the best one in the nation, in Sir David Feely. So uh, that that's what I would say. Coordinators. I've, uh, I've got Dan Enos and Blake Baker his first year with Miami, and then he went to Rhett Lashley for his offensive coordinator in 2020. Um, yeah, the SMU coach right currently. Yep. And then his third season, he had uh, – I guess he called the plays because it's showing that Rhett Lashley's the OC. So, maybe Manny just took the, the helm himself. Well, he's uh, – yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I do think that's it. I mean, that's where he'll have to improve. Um, 
you know, and then obviously it's brand new to him working with like the transfer portal the way it is now and, and the whole NIL stuff, that's going to be brand new. And so he's just going to have to figure out how, how he wants to deal with that moving forward as a coach. Yeah. Blake Baker went to LSU and he did the play calls his last year at Miami. So there you go. All right. At Blue Devil 2K10, would love to hear our thoughts on the potential for next year's defense, given uh, coach's performance at PSU and basically everywhere he's been. I mean, he's had great defenses. I I think a rising star, even before we even get there, is going to be Trey Freeman. Whoa, yeah, boy. And Bulls I think Trey, I think Trey Freeman under Coach Diaz is going to have a great couple of years. And I think VJ Anthony could have a great time there too. Just local couple, obviously a couple of local guys that we know a lot about and we've seen play here. But I really think. Trey Freeman's going to be the next great Duke linebacker. Uh, I'm going to add a, a guy to that on, on the defensive side of the football. Everyone's talking about Wes Williams. They were talking about him in spring ball last year. He had another great season this season. Um, here, here's Now, I will say this uh, as well. So you got Trey Freeman. Scott, I'm 100% agreement with you. You got Wes Williams on the line. If you want to go to the next level of the defense in that secondary, it's Chandler Rivers. And you know what you've seen, at least from Trey and Chandler, is on social media and publicly during all this transition, those two guys have been leaders, at least verbally and publicly. And I, we were speaking to Trey um, after the uh, presser um, on Saturday, and I was like, man, I've been hearing from people that you're you're going to be the guy to step in that leadership role next year. And Dwayne happened to be like, right, this is right beside us. He's like, yeah, if that guy will hand the keys over, he keeps hogging the keys, you know, like joking with Dwayne. But I do think Trey's going to be a leader. I think Chandler is being a vocal leader. He's stable. It's, you know, Chandler's not – he doesn't have one foot out the door in the portal. He's sticking it around. And then same with Wes. I think those are going to be three major key leaders on the defense next year. So, yeah, I think we could be really good on defense to, to answer that question. Anytime, Jamie. Unmute. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get to my next question. Uh, Peter Dodge. Uh, he wants to know if any of us are able to attend the Birmingham Bowl. Cue the Price is Right losing horn for me and Jamie. (laughs) Jamie, you already said it. Yeah, I will be coming back from uh, my family Christmas trip on a boat. I will be on a boat. Had it been the Gasparilla Bowl, I would have had to have watched the entire game in one of the sports bars. But I get back at around, I think, 730 in the morning. It's about a four and a half hour drive from Charleston to Durham. Might speed a little bit to try to get back sooner than later so I can watch at least the second half. I've already talked to the campaign. Dwayne Carter was at the presser. I told him he was a little disgusted with me, but he understood my position. So, yeah, unfortunately, I will not be there. But next year, next year, because I am not planning anything until that ACC schedule releases in January. I've learned my lesson. But to answer the yes, we will be there. Josh and I will be there. Um, you know, and Brian living upon the happy wife, happy life. So we got to give him kudos there. That may be the only thing he's ever done correctly for Bethany. So there That's you right. go. And we'll, and Scott will be uh, making the trip with the hard hat guys, um, heading down and hanging with them. So they're going to be there. There'll be a tailgate. We'll let you know on social media about details. Obviously it's a 12 noon kickoff if I'm not mistaken. So it'll be an early breakfast type tailgate. I don't know to what extent we'll be able to do it, but we will have something where Duke fans can get together hang, and hang out. Those that make the trip. You guys are, will be an hour behind, though. I saw it was an 11 o'clock kickoff. I Is think it? y'all are – yeah, I, I think y'all are an hour behind. I could be wrong. Oh, if it's 12 Eastern, then, and if we're in Central time, that'd be 11. Yep. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll that's double check. Point. No, that's yeah, a good we'll point. Suck. All right, and he had uh, – Peter Dodge had like a statement here I thought I'd read. I thought it was pretty good. He said, I believe we've grown fond of the assistant coaches – assembled by the previous administration, not to be named. I believe most of us are all in with the Manny Diaz hire. As of today, two former assistants coaches have made the move to Community College Station. I thought that was fun, Community College Station. Peter's always good for a a nice little dig. Uh, Manny has every right to bring in his people versus retaining assistant coaches already here, which we discussed that. So I just thought that was good. 
at T.S. Lester underscore. Hey, Jamie. Yeah. Real quick. Let me reiterate what Peter just said. Everyone needs to understand Trooper Taylor was the only coach retained from the Cutcliffe era. And and Elko did not owe any him, him or anyone that. Manny Diaz does not, does not owe anyone a job. Like, he is the brand new head coach. Technically, all these coaches, after that bowl game is over, technically they walk into his office with a resignation letter, and he can choose to accept that resignation letter or not. Like, that's basically, I, I'm not saying that's exactly what happens, but, I mean, in a nutshell, that is what happens. Like, those guys say, basically, we're at the mercy of Manny Diaz if he wants me on his staff. So that's just the way it goes, guys. That's the coaching. That's the way the coaching uh, carousel uh, goes every single season. So anyway. It's it's a business. Plain and simple, folks. It's a business. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. If Manny Diaz had come in in the same situation that Mike Elko did, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But it's a tough decision for an incoming coach when you've had two winning seasons, potentially two bowl game victories in a row, what do you do? Do you shake things up to where these players are used to a certain offense, certain defense, to where it could take time for these players to learn a new playbook on both sides of the ball? So, yeah, I, I think this is kind of a, you know, a dress rehearsal for these guys, even though they've been here two years to show Manny that they want to be here and that he should keep them on. <clears throat> All right. At TS Lester underscore, how much does uh, Summerall? leaving uh, Troy help or hurt us. I mean, you could look at that one of two ways, in my opinion. You, I mean, leaving, they could they could be, uh, Troy could just get completely pumped up for, for an interim coach and just, like, play lights out. Or, I mean, you could you could lay down and roll over. I mean, the same could be said about Duke. I mean, what's what's going to happen with Duke at, at the bowl game? We, we just don't, we have no idea. We, we think we know because um, Troopers got the, got the troops per se, uh, ready to roll. But, uh, and we know that, but it's just going to be interesting to see what happens between two teams with two interim coaches on December 23rd. Breaking news. While we're recording this podcast, football scoop, who is very reputable has put out that indeed Trooper Taylor is going to go to A&M, um, after the bowl game. But while we're sitting here, my phone is going and I'm, and when I say, like anyway, at sources. If you guys will trust my sources, I'm my web is getting deeper into the Duke football thing. That he has not accepted a position at Texas A&M as of yet. It does not mean that he won't, but it, no matter what football scoop says, he has not. And I would like to remind anybody that's hearing any news that comes out of Texas A&M back in November. Man, this is gonna be bad. Tyler cannot put this out as a clip. Back in November, Mike Elko told players' families that he was at Duke until his daughter graduated high school. He will say anything he needs to say. So at the end of the day, if he's saying what he needs to say to try to get Trooper Taylor to come, Trooper Taylor has not signed a contract with Texas A&M. He has not as of 9.13 p.m. after the Football Scoop article came out. He has not signed. Period. So just... Breaking Say, news. Boy, you only Say, get that breaking news right here on this podcast. Like, I was not going to get it anywhere else. So basically, Josh, what you're saying is football coaches are coaches on Saturday and politicians Sunday through Friday. Basically. Got it. <laughs> oh, Midnight Mike at it again. Uh, Ronnie Hornet Day <laughs> says uh, he wants to know, has anyone opted out of the bowl game? And not that not that we've heard, right? I mean, Mike, Mike than, Elko has. Yeah, Mike Elko <laughs> opted out. <laughs> it was on the TV from the photo. Well, Scott, you had it, right? Go ahead, Scott. Oh. No, it, it was something that the um, ACC network was doing earlier, and they asked it who was opting out of the bowl game. And it was funny because John Summerall from Troy had opted out the coach, and they had that Mike Elko had opted out. So it was just hilarious to see that on the TV screen. And obviously, the you know 15-year-old me really started laughing when I saw it because I'm like, of course they opted out. It's going to be interesting on the Duke side, if I can, though, like on a serious note, like there are practices going on. You know, they're not – I think they're in bowl game prep starting probably tomorrow. Like legitimately, they weren't going to do anything more than a week out. 
I don't think. So, like, they'll probably start tomorrow. But, like, you have, like, guys like Aeneas Peebles, who have, they have not opted out. They've not told the coaches that they're not going to play. But my man's taking, like, a world tour, and rightfully so. He's one of the most sought-after players in the in the portal. So I don't know if, if, if he's getting back in time for the week of prep. Same would go for guys like Jordan Waters. You know, is he taking visits? Is he going around stinting those guys? Uh, because none of them have said that they're not playing in the bowl game. In fact, from what we have been told, uh, Riley Leonard will be um, Riley Leonard will be at the bowl game with his teammates. And so that's just the kind of guy he is with the character that he has. So, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't know officially that anyone, you know, has opted out of the bowl game. All right. At EEWVU uh, says battle of the interim coaches. Does Duke having, having a two week head start with their interim help much? Or is uh, it kind of a wash? Like So EEWVU, -E that's actually my former coworker, Eric. He is a UNC fan, but he does support us and listen to us. So Eric, thanks for that. What was the question again? Sorry. Having, the interim bowl do we yeah, have the yeah, advantage the, yeah. does do we have the advantage because we have a, a two-week start with the interim coach i, I don't i think yeah i think watch, I th right? yeah we've, we've already answered that question for yeah. the most yeah. part they start it's a week i mean they, they do a regular game week for a bowl yeah. they do they work on like i would assume they work on like fundamentals you know what i mean but any, anybody <laughs> can do that as far as like game prep it's going to be a week out and by the way eric is a unc fan and a west virginia graduate he's going to have some fun at the Duke's Mayo Bowl. All right. At real Matt Barbie. And go New Year's, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> at real Matt Barbie. Says he should not, he who should not be named targeted students with jerseys. What, if anything, do you think will be Manny Diaz's thing that come, that connects him to the fans and raises fan support, whether that be students, alumni, or everyday fans? And we, we already saw at the um, – well, I was at the basketball game, and uh, Coach Diaz got really got in got into it with the students. He got over there in the student section. They were doing their chant, you know, come come sit with us, come sit with us. He ran over there. He was dancing around, throwing throwing that uh, throwing that baby up in the air and everything else. Uh, so I, I think he's – I think he's going to really, really uh, try to interact with the students. I, I can see it. He's, he's young, energetic, and I, I just really think it'll be – Maybe even better than than he who should not be named. Uh, Billy Potter says, "I believe this is a great hire. I see the buzz in Manny, but he's got a question. He says it's early for this, but do you think our QB QBs next year will throw for more yards than Riley did? Maybe not not total yards he's talking about, but passing." To be determined, Billy. We don't know who the offensive coordinator is going to be. We don't know who the QB is going to be. There's hey, just repeat, a lot of unknowns. Yeah, repeat the question, Jamie. I'm sorry. Uh, he just he just wanted to know if we thought that our QBs next year could throw for more yards than what uh, what Riley Riley did. Like, well, say I mean, Riley like, did this year. Yeah, he only played five yeah. games. <laughs> what, <laughs> you, <laughs> call it true. 1100 <laughs> yards. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, for, it'll probably um, happen. Let's no, say for a whole truth. season. So, assuming like maybe let's let's, let's say Loftus starts. Do we think that he can throw for more yards and Raleigh? He better, but and I, and I mean this, he better because he doesn't have the legs necessarily. It's not his game. Riley's got that leg game, man. Like his running game was as potent or better than his passing game. And I think Grayson is more. I don't. Not that Grayson can't run, but Grayson throws the ball a whole lot more, so he would need to. And once again, I don't think. I think same thing in the, in the bowl game. Unless Henry's better, you're not going to see one run called for Grayson, like because they they don't want him to get hit and they don't want him to get hurt with no, with uh, Donald Tomlin as the uh, as the backup. The fourth, Jamie. How many did we have the entire Duke fan base send us in yeah. questions? I feel Pretty like much. we are rolling. <laughs> and I got uh, I got just I got just one more. It's and it's not a question. It's a. It's a statement. I thought it was good. No, it's from Jason Rogers on Facebook. Uh, Cash's I would like dad. to make yeah, Cash's dad, better better known as Cash's dad. Cash is famous for constantly being on the video board. Gotta love that. He knows how to get on that video board. He said, "I would like to make a positive statement to all the fans. With all the negativity around the departure, it was really exciting to hear and read all the feedback from our fan base with their feelings." And he also says that um, he feels the same thing has happened about the hiring process and the hiring of Diaz. 
He says, I mean, people are getting mad at each other about butts in the seats. And he says, this is wonderful. And he's right. I mean, he said from the 80s to the late 2000s, there was little passion for the program or e even from the university. He said, yes, all the topics of Duke football are great discussion pieces and we love our program. He said, so let's root, root, root for our team to victory. And I thought that was good. That's a good Absolutely. way to end the end. The Ab Absolutely. And I want to find this Twitter account, guys. What's the, uh, we, Brian, we met him at the, uh, as in the Nick. Yes. Yeah. Fill the way. Yeah, Phil yeah, Wade, I believe yep. that's it. Let me let me look at the uh so I, th I think is the guy's name is Nick. Um yeah, it's at Phil the Wade. Uh and we're like he's working out details, but he has a legitimate vision and plan for a fan led uh you know promotion to try to get Wallace Wade full. Um and so there's a lot of moving parts to that and he's in the vivid stages of it. But listen, we're all behind that. If there's something that can be done, especially fan led. Um, to get butts in the seats, we're all for that. So go go follow it, and I'm sure he'll give you more details. We're gonna we'll do everything in our power to help out as well. So yeah, go go see that. Jamie, thanks for the uh, for the questions. Actually, thank you, listeners. They're great questions, awesome questions. Sorry, we got on a couple soapboxes. I probably said some couple things I should have said tonight, but it's all right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it is that time now. We're kind of in a dead spot. You know, the second week of December, uh, as far as this week in Duke football history. Um, but Scott, uh, what they did, they went the extra mile, went the extra mile this month in Duke yeah. football history. There we go. It, it, we'll extend it a little bit, but, um, but let's hear, uh, let's, let's see what Scott has for us this week in Duke football history. Scott, take it so away. A, lo a little piece of knowledge here for those of you that want to win a trivia contest. This will be the earliest that Duke has ever played a bowl game in the history of Duke playing bowl games. The 26th of December is the earliest they've ever played before next Saturday. So for this week in Duke football history, we're going to go back five years to the Independence Bowl, or as I call it, the Armpit of Louisiana Bowl, where the number 22 Duke Blue Devils defeated Temple 56-27 with an unbelievable day from Daniel Jones, 30 of 41, 423 yards, five touchdowns and two interceptions. TJ Roming, I'm, not, I'm sorry, did I say TJ Roming? It, I can't read, I can't read my stuff. Forgive me. Anyway, I seriously can't read what I got up here. Duke one, <laughs> Duke, Duke one. one. That's Duke all. One. That's Duke one. all that yeah. matters. Duke T, one. TJ Roming had a huge game that day. He did. Also, I, the screen went black on me, boys. <laughs> And this was brought to you by Bull City Sheet Metal. <laughs> Go to bullcitysheetmetal.com for all your duck work needs. If you can, what is it? What do you say? You can it. They hey, can I, can, it or I got that in front of me. Let's do that. Oh, this go ahead, Scott. Was, this was all right. Take two. Take two. No, no, this isn't a take two. This is all staying in. No, no, no. Take two That's for the me. ad read. All right, go ahead. So this was this week in Duke football history, brought to you by Bull City Sheet Metal. <laughs> No matter what your duck needs are, if you if the air goes through it, they make it. Give them a call today at 919-354-0993 or visit bullcitysheetmetal.com. And Lord forbid me for screwing that up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we, re we remember, though, Duke beat the crap out of somebody and TJ Roming and Daniel Jones led the way. That was it. That was good. That was good. We appreciate Scott. And actually, if we can say this, we're getting towards the end of the season. We really do appreciate our sponsors. Bullshit. <laughs> Bull City Sheet Metal. One more time. I knew that was going to happen. Bull City Sheet Metal. Bull City Sheet Metal. I sounded like Jim over here. But, uh, cover mechanical. <laughs> Bull, Bull City Sheet Metal. <laughs> cover mechanical contractors. We appreciate our sponsors. And while we have it, before we uh, send it to Brian. Uh, for the tell of the tape, I uh, do want to remind you if you're watching right now on YouTube uh, that you can uh, like and subscribe um, and, uh, and and follow us there. Leave us comments. Uh, obviously, X, uh, Instagram, and uh, TikTok. We're at Duke FB Talk on Facebook. You can search Duke Football Talk, DukeFootballTalk.com, all that good stuff. Um, guys, you know, you've been awesome this season. We appreciate five star ratings and reviews if we've earned them. Look, man, sometimes this is, these are train wrecks, um, but we have fun doing it. We really do. And, you know, we don't get paid for doing this. This is something we do 
uh, because we really do – our focus is we want to see the Duke football program continue to take steps forward. And so at the end of the day, we appreciate your support and listening and sharing with other Duke fans. Brian, it is that time. Uh, we have a, an opponent to talk about, and uh, we don't know anything about him. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, Josh. Take it away, Brian. It's to tell the tape for the Troy Trojans out of the Sun Belt Conference. Last year, Troy went 12-2 and and won the Sun Belt title. They would go on to the Cure Bowl, where they would defeat University of Texas San Antonio 18-12. to Now, heading into this year's Birmingham Bowl, Troy's 11-2, and and they repeated as Sun Belt champions, taking App State to the woodshed as they defeated them 49-23. to Now, John Sumrall has already left to go to Tulane, so defensive coordinator Greg, Greg Gasparato, I hope I said, said that right, was named the interim coach. And before that, getting that interim tag, boy, we're all messing up tonight. It's fine, folks. We're in the offseason. Gasparato, as I stated, was the defensive coordinator for the Trojans. Now, before Gasparato was the defensive coordinator for Troy, he had assistant coaching stints at Louisville, uh, App State, and Wofford. Now, this is the third time that Duke and Troy have met. Yes, they have played before on the football field, and Duke leads the overall series two games to none. The first ever meeting between Duke and Troy took place on September 28, 2013, during that magical season in Durham, where Duke defeated Troy 38-31. to The two teams would meet again the following year in Troy, Alabama, where Duke would win again. 34 to 14 over Troy. Now, overall, Troy has played seven ACC schools all time, and they have a 1 in 13 overall record. The Trojans' only win against an ACC school was against Florida State back in 1946 when Troy defeated FSU 36 to 6. Of course, FSU wasn't in the ACC back then, but we'll still throw that in there. Now, Troy is making their second straight bowl appearance in 13th overall as a program, and they are 8-5 and five overall in bowl games. Now, Duke is making their second straight bowl game as well in their 15th bowl game overall. Duke is looking to win their fifth straight bowl game, a streak that began back at the Pinstripe Bowl, and Indiana fans, the field goal kick was still not good. And now it's time for Did You Know? The Troy athletic teams have had a variety of nicknames throughout the years, from Bulldogs to Teachers to the Red Wave. As the football team began competition in the 1910s, they were called the Bulldogs or Teachers since the school began as a teacher's college. In 1922, the group was called Trojans for the first time ever. That lasted until new football coach Albert Elmore arrived on campus in 1931. A graduate of Alabama, Elmore changed the nickname to the Red Wave, a variation of Crimson Tide. The Red Wave moniker stuck until 1973 when the student body was asked to vote for a new team nickname. Right before the first game of the 1973 season, the team traveled to Louisiana Monroe without a nickname. However, The students voted that Saturday morning, with the winner being the Trojans. The current nickname won by a 2-1 to margin with the ballots being tallied just hours before kickoff. With the new nickname, the Trojans battled hard against Northeast Louisiana to a 15-15 tie. Now, T-Roy is the actual Troy mascot and has been a familiar sight at Troy athletic events since making his first appearance in the mid-1980s. T. Roy became the school mascot after a campus-wide decision on the new name for a new mascot. And since that time, T. Roy has been a mainstay for all games as he roams the sidelines with his sword and Trojan attire. And that was the tell of the tape for the Troy Trojans. I was blocking you guys out. I don't know what y'all said, so thank God I did not see your faces or it would have been another train wreck. Well, it's all right. It's all right. It's it's forever in the private chat. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. That was the tale of the tape. Not yet sponsored. And by the way, we are looking for more sponsors heading into next year. We'll just be straight up. We're probably going to restructure uh, maybe our sponsorship levels, uh, giving you some different options there um, in, in the sponsorships. But if you're interested um, in that, we have great relationships with both Bull City Sheet Metal and Cover Mechanical Contractors. In fact, just saw Jamie with Cover Mechanical. Last week, uh, gave him um, some Section 17 uh, swag. He, he in return, fellas, gave me a bottle 
of Comfort Mechanical Contractors barbecue sauce, baby. I haven't tried it yet, but they got their label slapped on a barbecue sauce. So, hey, there's four of us. What the hell? I, I got one bottle, man. Yeah, oh, I actually have two. I have one with Bull City Sheet Metal on it, and I have one with Cover Mechanical Contractors on it. They both, they both went in on the mm. barbecue uh, sauce thing. So, well, maybe when we go, maybe when you guys go and buy me my steak, I'll bring you uh, some of that barbecue sauce to take home with you. Hey, McRib Rick, it is. Yeah, McRibs are good with barbecue sauce. So yeah, Josh, we'll do that. Yeah, you got to drown <laughs> it in barbecue sauce to convince yourself it's meat. <laughs> All right. Well, even even though we're, what, 12 days away, we've still got to do our predictions because nope. this will be our last episode before the actual bowl game itself. And, folks, we're still offering a free T-shirt to those of you who correct who predict the score as closely as possible, both on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. But before we get out our predictions out. No, we don't have any predictions. God almighty, this episode is just careening off of a cliff. We're going to get to our predictions right now. Uh, fellas, I will say this. The line has not moved. Troy is still a seven and a half point favorite over the Duke Blue Devils. The over under as of right now is only 43 and a half points. So they're not expecting a high scoring game. So as always, we're going to give our thoughts on the score as well as the Jersey combination. So anyone want to go first? You want me to take the helm? May I ask a question, uh, Mr. Kennedy? Yes. Uh, do we know yet if we are the home team or if we are the away team? I don't no, I mean, no, but everything that I'm seeing shows us as the home team. But as soon as I say that, I'm sure they'll switch it. Cause that um, will make, that will make my Jersey. Uh, right. You know, so yeah, are we going to stay home? We're going to go with home? Let's just go home. And let's if they go, go away, we have, more then... we have more options in the home jersey. So let's go home. Yeah, exactly. Right, what did you say the over under was again? 43 and a half with Troy right. being a seven and a half point favorite. Oh, I don't care about Troy. But that's that's a stupid take. Take Duke in that line. Like how in the world? Anyway, um, so I'm going to go uh, on the uniform combination. Uh, I am going to go uh, Duke with the white lids with the Gothic Duke. I think that's been the theme for this year. I'm going to go white lids, Gothic Duke. I'm going to go blue tops, white bottoms. It's going to be the white, blue, white, classic Duke. A lot of times in bowl games, they you kind of go with that anyway. I'll go white, blue, white, but with the Gothic Duke. And then I'm going to have Duke winning this football game uh, 28 no, 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 no. 31. I got to let Polino kick a field goal. <laughs> of uh, course. 30, 31 to 21, Blue Devils. 31 to 21, Blue Devils. Who's next? I'll go. Oh, sorry, Jamie. Go ahead, Jamie. You sure? Okay. Um, so we did talk with the equipment staff on Saturday, Josh and I. And I will tell you, the uniform has already been picked, but they did not let me know. I promise you, folks. They, they said, nope, we know who you are. We're not telling you a word. Um, I think Duke's going to go with a blue out if they are the home team. I do not think it's going to be the Hellraiser. I think it's going to be that luscious big blue or white D, I should say. If they're doing a blue helmet, it's got to be a white D. It's a big white D. As far as the score, if Trooper's still coaching this game, which all signs show that he is based off of Nina's press release and everything like that, this team's motivated. They went bowling. Actual bowling, their first practice. They had a good time. Morale is up. I'm going to say Duke. I'm going to take your 28, Josh. I'll go 28, Duke. I'll go Troy 17, 28, 17. So I'll be just a little bit over on the over itself. So, um, hey, I won't be there. But, folks, if you can get down to Birmingham, hang out with Josh and Scott, please do it. This team needs all the support it can get to end the season on a good note to get the eighth win of the year as we head into Diaz days, Diaz dynasties, whatever you want to call it. Go Duke. Who's next? Uh, I'll go. I kind of, I kind of agree with Josh on the, I think I'll go with the white, blue, white. I think they'll just kind of, kind of vanilla ish. I'm not going to go with the script. I'll go, uh, I'll go with the blue D big blue D. Um, score uh, if I'm being honest I haven't watched any of Troy I do know they beat the crap out of App State uh, uh, who replaced uh, James Madison 
Uh, they played James Madison earlier in the season where they only lost, they only lost to James Madison by two points. I think it's going to be a close game. Um, either way, I think Duke pulls ahead maybe uh, in the fourth quarter and the final score. I'm going to go Duke 30, uh, Troy 17. Duke 30, Troy 17. So that's three overs right now. Big dog, why don't you go ahead and finish this up? All right, so I'm going to throw a couple numbers at you just for giggles. Troy is averaging 31.2 points a game. Uh, passing, they threw for 3,500 yards on the season. Rushing, they threw for, though they ran for 2,000 yards. So 6,000 yards total offense. There's not too bad. I mean, they're 11 and 2. Can't beat that. I'm um, looking at ESPN right now on their little uh, football mania, whatever they call it. Duke, 57% of the folks have picked Duke to win the game. So obviously they're picking the name over Troy, which is great. Um, so for uniform combination, I like the Duke. I like the Gothic Duke uh, in. I'm trying to think though. I think we'll go blue lid, Gothic Duke. I'm going to blue out. I don't think blue on blue. I think it's going to be plain Jane. Um. Obviously, if we go the other way, since nobody else did this, I like the icy whites with the white helmet and the big blue D. If we have to, if we go down that road, um, as far as the score, I mean they score 31 points a game. I don't know if they're going, they going anywhere close to that against Duke's defense, especially a motivated Duke team at that. I we're going to get the over easily. I think it could. I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing them score a couple points. Us uh, score about 35 of them. Them score about 14 or so. But I think I'm going to go 31-17. I think Duke just dominates the second half, wins the game. And, you know, another notch on the bowl win on the streak that Duke has going for him. Hey, and if you can be there, like we said, come out, have a good time. If you can't be there, watch it at home yell and scream at the television enjoy yourself because that's exactly what we're going to be doing this year hopefully during the bowl season we're going to have a good time and remember go do so that is our last predictions as the four of us for this season you've still got a chance uh we're a few days away from the actual bowl game, so it won't be until probably next Wednesday or Thursday before the post comes out for your predictions. Please be sure to put them in. Please put who you have winning. Just putting the score itself does not qualify you. You have to pick a team to win the game. Uh, and then after the game is done, we will pick our winners. And then for our last episode of the season, the reaction episode to the bowl game, we will announce the winners. So, it's been another fun episode. It's been all over the place. Scott messed up. I messed up. We all messed up. But you know what? We're technically in the off season. We're awaiting this bowl game. We've had a lot going on the last week. We're all tired, man. Scott, what's up? Oh, I forgot one more thing because I don't think we're recording before it happens. Go West Virginia. Win the Duke's Mayo Bowl. <laughs> yes, I will concur. I think all four of us will concur. Josh, did we miss anything before we... uh? Close up shop before the ball No, game. we do appreciate our partnership with the Durham Devils Club. Obviously, Coach Diaz is jumping on, on board with that. And, um, and yeah, I mean, if you're interested in, in learning more about the NIL, uh, let us know. Uh, we can help you out and get you pointed in the right direction. But, yeah, no, it's been really good. And we're coming down to the end, guys. I think we're going to have one more, like, normal probably podcast reaction to the bowl. Yep. And then we'll go into off-season mode. And, you know, honestly, this off-season, we don't know what it's going to look like. There's going to be some DDC podcasts that we do in the off-season, we know for sure, uh, with some coaching staff and some players and maybe even some NFL guys when they come into town. So if you're not a DDC member, at least at the $25 level, what in the world are you doing? Uh, go do that, and you'll, be, you'll have access to all that stuff. So, yeah, one more. Uh, get ready, because the last one, we're not going to have a ton to talk about. We're going to get all sentimental and thank everybody, and it's going to be good get ready yeah and it will be one last chance for a mailbag we'll throw one more out there uh there won't be a tail of the tape there won't be this week in blue devil history because nothing was going yeah nothing's going nothing else is going on heading into the new year but thank you to each and every one of you who watch us who listen to us who do both uh we will be back for one more episode 
But that'll do it for this one. It's, again, been a fun one. We hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be back in the coming weeks to give our reaction on all things Duke and Troy. But until next time, for Josh Cox, for Jamie Holt, for Scott Medlin, and producer Justin Sykes, I'm Brian Kennedy, and this has been another episode of the Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast.